you today to um, Dr. Odo. Did I say that right? Okay. He is uh, new to San Antonio, just here since July 1st. He came to us from California. Um, Dr. Odo obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Biological Sciences actually in Italy. I'm not going to try to say the name of the university. <laughs> and then his PhD um, from the University of California at Irvine in um, Neurobiology and Behavior. Um, he currently serves in as, as an assistant professor in the Department of Physiology here at the uh, Health Science Center. And um, <clears throat> his research interests include understanding the molecular mechanisms underlying the early cognitive deficit in Alzheimer's disease, understanding the molecular pathways underlying frontotemporal lobar degeneration, I've been practicing, and genetic approaches to probe neuronal function. Right. And he's here today um, to talk to us about the mouse model of Alzheimer's. So please welcome Dr. Odo. And again, I think people will be, you know, struggling in. Thanks. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to present some of my data. As you all know by now, I started here July 1st. So the majority of the data I'm going to show is from the work I've done in Irvine. And then I'll spend five minutes at the end trying to tell you what we are um, doing or we plan to do here in uh, San Okay. Okay, so basically I start giving you a brief overview of Alzheimer's disease. Then I talk a little bit about the animal model we made that we call 3 sdgad and then I spend most of the time talking about the interaction between these two proteins that are key in the AD pathogenesis. And then, as I said, five, I will spend five minutes at the end just to tell you what we're actually doing now in, in San So AD, uh, there are, it's estimated about five million people suffer from this disorder today in the US. And by 2050, it's, about, uh, it's going to be about 10 to uh, 12 million uh, that are uh, be affected by this disorder. This is due to basically the increase in people, um, in people life expectancy. Because you know by mid-century, more uh, almost 70 percent of uh, the population will be over 85 years of age. And so, from a uh, neuropathological point of view, Alzheimer's the AD brain is characterized by two main lesions. We have uh, extracellular plaques here formed by a small peptide called amyloid beta or A beta. And intraneuronal inclusions form, uh, or uh, neurofibrillary tangles, uh, neuro, uh, intraneuronal inclusions form, formed by a protein called tau, which is hyperphosphorylated in these inclusions. From a genetic point of view, there are two kinds of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So there is an early onset, which represents about 5% of the cases. And these are uh, due to uh, mutations in one of these three genes. The amyloid precursor protein is a gene from which this A beta peptide accumulates in the brain is derived. And we have pressing unit one and pressing unit two, which are two enzymes involved in the uh, processing of APP, as I'll show you in just a second. The majority of cases, are, however, is sporadic, and the causes are not known. They are just risk factor. The major risk factor, as I uh, mentioned before, is age. And also the, uh, the presence of this E4 allele for the ApoE gene, which is in chromosome 17. Another thing I want to mention is the tau gene. 
So tau genetically is not linked to uh, Alzheimer's disease. However, again, accumulates into the brain to form these changes. Mutation, the tau gene, leads to frontotemporal dementia, which is characterized by this, uh, the accumulation of these tangles into the brain. They are similar to those uh, seen in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, a beta that accumulates here, this cartoon in red, that accumulates into the brain of these people is derived from a longer precursor, the adult precursor protein. So again, mutation in this, uh, in this uh, gene leads to, uh, to uh, familiar Alzheimer's disease. And these are 100% penetrant. And so an APP protein can be processed in one of two ways. Either, uh, usually 95% of the cases is processed via this, uh, uh, through this alpha secretase enzyme, which cleaves the precursor in the middle of the A-beta sequence, again in red here, therefore precluding A-beta formation. The, in the other 5% of the cases, however, the precursor is called, is cleaved by this beta secretase and then forming this beta stub of C99, which is subsequently cleared by a gamma secretase complex that liberates A beta. There are two major forms of A beta, A beta based on the amino acid length, either 40 or 42. And it's known that A beta 42 is more pathological, it aggregates faster. And uh, the, the uh, pressing link 1 and 2 that I told you before uh, are basically the major enzyme that are uh, part of this gamma secretase complex. And again, mutation in these, in these proteins lead to uh, an increase in a beta 42 production and to Alzheimer's disease. Now, on the other end, again, the function is to stabilize microtubules in neuron. It's a microtubule binding do uh, protein, and it's genetically linked to frontotemporal dementia. And basically, its uh, activity is modulated by phosphorylation. So it's thought that increasing phosphorylation will decrease the affinity to tau to the microtube, and so the, the, the axons and the dendrites are more uh, flexible. However, in AD, tau is hyperphosphorylated, so it's thought that it, it, it detaches from the microtube, so therefore accumulates, forming these uh, neurofibular tangles. So my interest has been in trying to understand what's the, the relationship between these, uh, these two inclusion, the beta peptide forming the, uh, these plaques and the tau protein form in these, in these uh, neurofibrillary tangles. Because at the pathological level, the only way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease is to both of these proteins, both of these inclusions to be present. And so to study this, we went first to the, did the literature research, and it's, pretty, uh, it's evident that um, uh, the animal model, there are several animal models of Alzheimer's disease, on the left column here, there are animal, the animal models that don't express the APP gene or, or the, even the A beta peptide try to module, to, to, uh, try to model the, uh, the onset of these uh, plaques pathology. And people have used different strategies, and these mice develop plaques. However, they do not develop neurofibrillary tanks. They do not have tau accumulation. Then on this side of the column, uh, there are uh, mice that are overexpressed tau with a wild tau with different mutations, and these mice develop neurofibrillary tangles. However, they do not develop uh, a beta pathology of plaques. And so this was kind of surprising because, again, for example, this AP, these mice that overexpress APP, they have a different kind of mutation that in humans lead to, uh, to Alzheimer's disease. So they lead to accumulation of a beta, accumulation of tau. However, in mice, we have accumulation of beta. Sometimes even the density is even more than the one saw in uh, the one saw in uh, AD brains. However, these mice do not develop tangle, tangle pathology. So to have, to be able to address or to study the beta time interaction in vivo, first we generated a new animal model, tried to mimic both of the neuropathological changes that occur in the brain of these, uh, of these people. So the way we used to be, uh, did this, we started from a mouse where the, uh, there is a not clean mutation in the pressing link gene. So this mutation is linked to familiar Alzheimer's disease. So people with this mutation, 100% of the cases are, are lead, uh, develop, will develop Alzheimer's disease. Again, this is the gene that's involved in the processing of the APP. However, again, even though in people People with this mutation will sorry. People with this mutation will develop Alzheimer's disease. Here, these mice don't have any neuropathological changes. 
So what we did, we had a single cells from these mice and co-injected two different transgenes. And there are neuronal specific promoters. One gene in, encodes for the APP uh, protein, which is the, again the precursor for the A-beta, which has a Swedish mutation. This is again a mutation link, linked to uh, familiar Alzheimer's disease. The other gene is uh, uh, the encoding for the tau protein with that P301L mutation, which leads to frontotemporal dementia. So what we did, we co-injected two transgenes into whole cell uh, uh, harvest from a uh, Nokia 9. Uh, so these two transgenes integrated in the same genetic loss. And so they are co-segregated at uh, the same time. And so as long as we breed the F, as long as we breed the offsprings to the parental line, 50% of the mice will be triple transgenic. So even these mice are triple transgenic, they breed as easily as they were a single transgenic animal. And so moreover, we were able to uh, breed these F1s to each other. And so now we have homozygous mice. There are homozygous for the mutation, for the, they are not the, for the mutation, the presenilin gene, and they are homozygous for these two transgenes. And so these mice develop uh, plaque pathology, a beta pathology. Here is just an assemble using different approaches to so immunohistochemistry with um, basically up here using uh, an antibody against A beta. And then different histological, different histological uh, technique, techniques, again, using, uh, showing this A beta pathology. Also, these mice develop tau pathology. These are sometimes a seda section, most of the times a seda section, the one I just showed you using similar histological techniques or, or in new end to show again that these mice have a beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. In addition, these mice show an aged beta inflammatory response, cognitive decline, and cholinergic dysfunction, which are other features that um, they share with the AD, the AD brains. So how do we use, so the way I use these mice, again, is to study the interaction between A, beta, and tau. Now we have an animal model that shows age-dependent accumulation of plaques uh, and uh, age-dependent accumulation of neurofibrillary tangles. So the question I wanted to ask is, do A, beta, and tau interact? And from, uh, from the uh, genetic data, the human genetic data, it seems that A, beta might be triggering uh, the cascade of events leading to uh, Alzheimer's disease. And this is due because all the mutations that have been isolated today lead to mismetabolism of the APP processing and the beta production. Again, the mutation in tau do not lead to Alzheimer's disease, but lead to front temporal dementia. So there is this idea, this idea in the field that A beta is upstream and this accumulation of A beta leads to all the downstream events that uh, eventually culminate in Alzheimer's disease. So the way we try to address this question, if A-beta time interact, is using, um, basically we are determining the impact of modulating the A-beta on the onset of the tau pathology, and the, the impact of modulating the tau pathology on the onset of progression of the A-beta. So there is not enough time to show you some of these data, so I'll just refer to this uh, manuscript. However, I'd be happy to uh, talk about this in more detail at the end of the talk. So for today, I'll just show you the first part where we actually modulate a beta pathology using immunological or genetic and genetic approaches to determine if this will uh, uh, modulate or alter the onset and progression of the pathology. So, uh, so first we use an immunological approach. This is based on some uh, early work done by Ilan Pharmaceutical in San Francisco. In 1999, they, showed this, they published this paper in Nature showing that uh, immunizing uh, APP transgenic mice, which have plaque pathology with, uh, uh, with a beta peptide, leads to the clearance of these deposits from the brain and rescues the cognitive decline. And so since then, people have used different approaches to, uh, different immunological approaches to try to clear these a beta deposits. And one of them, uh, by David Morgan in, uh, uh, in Florida, they showed that a single administration of an anti-beta antibody directly into the brain of uh, transgenic mice is enough to clear these A-beta deposits. So what we did, we used this approach as a tool to decrease A-beta from the brain and to see how that will affect the tau pathology. So the first experiment we did, we mimic what they did, we just inject an anti-beta antibody into the brain of the mice, of these triple transgenic mice. This is a single injection. 
in one side of the brain. So the others, we can use the other side as an internal control. And so we sacrificed the mice seven days after the injection. And so here in panel A, you can see the epsilateral <laughs> side receiving the, uh, the injection of two micrograms of antibody. There's a clearance of these uh, beta deposits compared to the controlateral side, which is, uh, in this case, not getting anything. And this is the immunohistochemistry or thioflame staining, showing again a, redu a reduction in these beta deposits. And here in our mice, we also have intraneuronal beta accumulation. And this approach, again, this is just high magnification of the C1 region of the hippocampus, show uh, again a more uh, detailed difference between uh, the ipsilateral side in G and the controlateral side in F. So uh, we were able to replicate David, Morgan da David Morgan's data, again, single intrahippocampal injection of the antibody to your CPET. At this point, we are, uh, we are, uh, we could adjust our question. Now we clear the beta, what does happen? What happens to the tau pathology after we clear the beta? As, as you can see, this is a section the one I just showed you. There is a marked reduction in the tau deposits here is in this somatomobility tau staining in G is basically absent in the ipsilateral side of the brain. And in J and, a and K show the quantification, the percentage decrease in a using two different anti-beta antibodies in A beta and tau. So this data, so what we did next, we used a, uh, older mice where the tau pathology is more advanced, the A beta and tau pathology is more advanced. Because as I mentioned before, these mice develop this pathology in an age-dependent fashion. So when we did the same thing in older mice, what we found is that, again, if you compare A with B, the A, the A would be the A beta pathology was um, actually decreased in the epsilon side, re the, um, receiving the anti A beta antibody. However, the tau pathology remained unchanged or uh, no major changes. And this basically data indicated that the A beta seems to be upstream of the cascade, uh, the cascade leading to a tau pathology, because if we can remove this trigger, we remove the tau pathology. However, the tau pathology depends on its phosphorylation aggregation state. So we have data that, uh, again, I can show you today for, for time's sake, that uh, in older mice, for example, at this age, the tau is more phosphorylated, it's more aggregated. So after tau aggregates, it's hard to remove it from the brain using an anti-beta intervention. And uh, a few years after this, uh, one, one or two years after this, we were happy and this data were replicated using a different approach. People had made an inducible uh, tau transgenic animal model where they, if they, turn, they can turn off the expression of the transgene and the, ta and the tau deposits were cleared from the brain. However, if they wait long enough that this tau deposits would become uh, uh, phosphorylated, aggregated, they would turn off the transgene expression of this tau deposit were uh, not removed. Basically, uh, basically concluding similar, uh, uh, reaching similar conclusion with our data. So at this point, um, we, uh, at this point we want to ask a question whether therapeutic intervention aimed at decreasing A beta will be sufficient to improve cognition in the presence of established plaques and tangles pathology. And this question arises from um, several published studies because since the 1999 paper on A beta immunization, there have been um, a couple of clinical trials with anti beta interventions. There are uh, ongoing clinical trials with uh, different, uh, uh, the, uh, com different drugs aimed at decreasing A beta or stopping production of A beta. And these, uh, in most of the cases, all the preclinical work has been done in animal models with just A beta pathology, not with tau. So it, for us, it was important to determine if we did, uh, to, the, to answer this question. So, what happens to the uh, a beta pathology, can we rescue the cognitive decline when plaques and tangles are already established? So to, uh, this is the experimental design that we used to try to address this question. So we start with 18 months old mice, and these mice have already, at this age, have already established plaques and tangle pathology. And we have two, uh, two groups of mice. One group receiving, uh, were actively immunized with A beta peptide, A beta 42 peptide, until they were 23 months and a half. Another group of mice were passively immunized. So these guys 
And we're using uh, protocols that are well established in the animal literature. And so these passive immunized mice, they're receiving a weekly injection of the an or directly of the antibody. And we start 20 months of age because we wanted to have both groups of the same age at the end of the experiments. And so as a control group, so we have untreated mice, age match and gender match untreated mice, and we have uh, mice that were injected just with the adjuvant. So the first, uh, so basically at the end of this experiment, uh, uh, this vaccination, we test the mice, behavior of the mice using two different tasks. The teammates, which measure ma uh, working memory, and briefly, basically what we do, put a mouse in the starting arm, and uh, we, for we block one of the two arms, and we basically force the mouse to make a choice, let's say to go here to the right hand. Uh, after, uh, and after he makes the choice, we block the right hand, so the mouse is left here to explore. At the end of this exploration period, they can change from one to three minutes. We put the mouse back in the starting hand, and at this point, he can make a free choice. Usually, mice like to alternate, and so they will uh, normally, a normal mouse will uh, explore the opposite side. And so by measuring the percentage of alternation, we can determine if the working memory is fine. We also use another task, which is the passive inhibitory avoidance. This is um, basically this little intervention from the, from the, uh, from the experimenter. So what, uh, basically, it's this box with two chambers. The two chambers are communicating inside from us with a sliding door. So what do, we put, what do we do? We put the mouse in this starting box, close the door, and just all the experiment that does is hit the button. Basically, a light goes on here, and the door opens. So mice don't like to stay in the light. They rather stay in the dark. So this other chamber is in the dark. So after the door opens from inside, the mouse will cross over and will uh, receive a mild food shock. At this point, the mice, the mouse should associate dead, the dark environment with this adversive shock. So what we do, uh, different time points later, we put the mouse again in the starting compartment. If the mouse will remember the association, after the door opens, it won't cross, it won't cross over. Basically, we just measure the latency to cross the dark compartment. And so these are the results of this, uh, of the immunization paradigm. Again, this is the teammates where 50% is represent a chance left or right. And so as you can see, non oops. As you can see, non-transgenic mice alternate about 70% of the cases. Sorry about this. And in red, we have the untreated mice or the adjuvant treated mice. And they, uh, you can see they are impaired because uh, they perform a chance, they perform a chance level. And in blue, we have the actively immunized mice, in yellow with the passively immunized mice. And you can see they perform significantly better compared to the control group. Here is the passive inhibitory avoidance which is uh, basically during the training. So first time we put the mouse back, after the door opens, it takes about 20 to 30 seconds for all the group to cross off. They receive the mild shock, and then we put them back at different time points. And so you can see, again, that the, uh, the control groups, the non-transgenic, the control groups, basically, they um, almost never cross back. So we stop the task after three minutes. However, with time, the non the, uh, sorry, the control groups, here, uh, uh, the control groups basically with time start to uh, lose this association and they start to go back again to the, uh, to the dark compartment. Whereas the immunized group, they uh, perform similar to the non transgenic basically they keep the association. At this point, we look at the brain of these mice. We wanted to, try, we wanted to find um, a correlation between this improvement and something changing in their brain. So we started with measuring A beta pathology. And so, uh, uh, basically here, uh, there is an immunohistogenous tree and thioflane, which, is, uh, which will detect these plugs. And so, as you can see, with, with the mice, with the active immunized mice, there were no changes in the number of plugs. Again, and this is consistent with uh, some of the literature data. And however, with the passively immunized mice, there is a significant decrease in number of plugs. And so, we, could exc we basically excluded plugs, so the the results from this, from this part here was that there was no correlation between plaques and the improvement in the, in the, in the cognition because, again, even these mice show the same improvement as these mice. Then we measured the directly A beta levels by ELISA, and here the only thing that changes in both 
in both active and passive immunized mice is a selective, de a selective decrease in ABA insoluble A beta 42 levels. So we have this correlation between an increase in soluble A beta 42 levels and the uh, changes in cognition. This point we look at the tau pathology, and these are different on the left, the 8188 PHF, are uh, different antibodies and again different um, uh, different phosphoepitopes of tau, basically. And in our mice, the pathology goes, uh, this is a heavier pathology, and as the mice age, the pathology becomes more aggressive. And this is a Gallia stain, uh, uh, which just uh, detects this uh, aggregation forms of tau. And so as uh, with the previous results, we have some changes in the early tau pathology, as detected here with this antibody T100 in both actively passive immunized mice. However, as the um, tau pathology becomes more, tau becomes more phosphorylated and aggregated, the changes disappear. So there are no changes in, um, for example, in neurofibrillary tangles. So again, from this, we can conclude that there is a dissociation between neurofibrillary tangles and the improvement in cognition. However, it seems that the earlier forms of tau may correlate. So to better understand that, we again, we did some biochemistry, and we just focus here on the ELISA, we directly measure um, tau, and as for a beta, we have the, there is a significant <coughs> decrease in soluble tau levels in the active and passive immunized mice. So at this point, we have two, we have a decrease in a beta 42, in soluble a beta 42, we have a decrease in soluble tau that both correlate with the improvement in cognition. So the next question we wanted to ask is, is the reduction of both necessary to rescue the cognitive impairment, or can we rescue the cognitive impairments by selectively decrease A beta 42 levels? To address this, we uh, change our experimental paradigm. Okay, so there are uh, published data in the literature that people, people have shown that a single, intra a single injection of this antibody can actually improve uh, some forms of behavior in APP only mice. So what we did, we use again um, all the mice the same age, and when the mice are sacrificed at 23 months and a half, this time the mice are just receiving four injection of antibodies. And, and uh, basically during these injections, we do the TMAs and the inhibitory avoidance. And as you can see here, we now call this group uh, acute antibody injections. And they perform, in the TMAs, they perform at chance level, so the behavior was not rescued. And when we do the uh, inhibitory avoidance, they again perform as the non, uh, this, they are treated in this case. Basically, they lose with time, they lose the association. Looking at the brain of these mice, again, we went to look for if uh, we saw that soluble A beta 42 were significantly decreased compared to the control. However, soluble tau levels were not. So basically, we were able to selectively, using this experimental paradigm, we were able to selectively decrease a beta 42 levels without changing tau levels, and this was not enough to change to uh, rescue the cognitive de decline in these mice. To summarize this first part, we showed that the removal of a beta leads to the clearance of the tau pathology, and this is the this was the first direct evidence that a beta and tau interact with a beta being a swing upstream of the tau pathology. We showed a chronic active and passive immunization reduced both soluble tau and a beta levels, and this was enough to improve cognition, even though plaques and tangles were uh, not altered. And we showed that reducing soluble and beta alone did not improve the cognitive phenotype in mice with plaques and tangles. And there is evidence in the, in the field, strong evidence now, that some a beta species, especially soluble a beta species, are more toxic than uh, these a beta plaques. And so our data proposing uh, some uh, the similar things may happen with tau pathology. So some soluble form of tau may be more toxic, and we and uh, in, at least in this experimental condition, we need to remove those soluble forms to improve cognition. Whereas neurofibrillary tangles, the one finds in AD brain, seems to be uh, less detrimental. The second part. Now we want to determine if we can alter the onset of a progression of tau pathology by uh, preventing a beta accumulation. So again, this is at the basis <coughs> of several clinical trials where people use gamma segregase inhibitors, for example, which will uh, block the production, the production of a beta 42. And so 
here we have an animal model where we can actually test this. We can t determine if we can, if we block a beta production, what happens to the onset and uh, uh, progression of traumatology. How do we do that? We first use a genetic approach. These are the mice, and the mice that we're using. Normally we're using the data I show you from these mice. So what we made this, so what we did, we bred these mice with the non-transgenic, and so what we did, we removed the mutation in the presenium gene. So we have this, what we call ATP tau mice. There are, again, the same mice just removing, breeding this mutation. <coughs> this mutation is known in people and in mice to increase the beta for production. So the goal was, again, to decrease the production. As a control group for these studies, we have the non-transgenic. We also, also have this line where the mutation is still there. However, the ATP, the human ATP transgene is absent. So the first thing we did, we analyzed these mice in the, in the Morris water maze as a function of age. So for those of you who are not familiar with the task, basically we put a mouse in a tank where there is a hidden platform. So mice don't like to swim, so in the beginning they will swim around trying to find an escape, and they will find it in their platform. Yeah. And so as soon as the mouse reaches the platform, we take it out and we put it back. We do about four trains per day until the mouse will learn where the platform location is. The mouse will navigate because there are extra, extra maze queues in the rooms. There are posters and uh, different queues around basically the, the tank. Basically, once the mouse finds the platform with an escape latency uh, um, smaller than 20 seconds, basically we do the prop trials. So what we do we move the platform from the tank, we put the mouse back, and we measure the time the mouse takes to find where the platform location was, how many crosses over we uh, do, or how much time we spend in each planet. And this is uh, this is reflects like working memory, which is in many hippocampal tank. So here we did the four groups of mice. Panel A just showed two months of age. All the mice, all the mice learned the task within about three days. And uh, so when we do the probe trial, we measure the time spent in the opposite quadrant, the number of platform location crosses, and the time uh, spent in the target quadrant. And so again, at two months of age, the mice don't have any pathology, none of the groups have pathology, and they perform similar. As the mice age, however, in B, at six months of age, you can see the triple transgenic in red start to take, basically they take longer to reach criterion, to find the platform 20 seconds or less. And so it takes about five days for them to reach criterion. Whereas the other mice, basically here we're just comparing red and blue, the APP tau mice perform as the non-transgenic in the control group. Again, this difference is, uh, becomes bigger with age, and here if we focus 18 months of age, the triple transgenic never reach criteria. Even after six days, they perform, but they, they, it takes them about 30 to 40 seconds to find the platform. However, the ATP tau mice find the platform similar to the non transgenic When we do the probe trials to measure, to determine if they will remember, again, all the, uh, in blue, the ATP tau mice perform similar as, uh, perform as the non-transgenic in the control groups. So these mice, by removing the mutation, the presenilin gene, seems to perform similar to the non-transgenic. Again, we look at the brain of these mice, as expected here, no surprises. This is, a, this is an A-beta ELISA, uh, uh, 6, 12, and 18 months of age. In red, you have the triple transgenic. In blue, you have this ATP tau mice. And again, there is a selective decrease in A-beta for the production. And no surprises here because the mutation that they will remove is known to increase A-beta for the production. When you look at the brain of these mice to see if the beta deposits were affected by the moving, by decreasing A-beta for the tumor. Again, you can see an age-dependent fashion. Even just comparing here the, the hippocampus in 18 months of age between triple transgenic and these APP tau mice, you can appreciate that there, is, um, there are basically no plaques at this age. It's some soluble beta starts, starts to be apparent at these 18 months of age. So there is basically uh, much less tau pathology, the onset is divisible, and uh, by comparing here the 18 months of age, you can appreciate there is a marked reduction in tau pathology. And this is despite the fact that the transgene uh, expressing tau is still, pre is still present, is still being expressed at the same levels within, the within these two groups of mice. So the only thing we did, we removed the mutation in the presenium gene, 
by default decreasing in beta for the due production. It did not affect the steady state level of the trans or the tau transient. Nevertheless, there were no tau deposits after removing a beta, after the blocking or preventing a beta production. So basically, to confirm this data, we use a different approach. We use an immunological approach. This time, we, humanize, we uh, again immunized mice against the A beta peptide starting at two months of age. So these mice, two months, don't have any pathology. So we try, the goal here is trying to prevent the A beta accumulation. And again, other people have shown that this experimental paradigm works in a APP only mice. So when we measure the A beta titer, however, we found that we have two groups of mice. We have a good anti, uh, anti uh, mice that uh, mount a good antibody response, and mice, mice that don't have a good antibody response. So in the beginning, we were a little bit disappointed, but then basically we use these low responders as an extra control group. And so here, basically, we first measure the A beta levels by ELISA. We have untreated groups, the adjuvant, mice that receive the adjuvant only. The L represents the low responders, mice that were uh, uh, immunized but didn't show any antibody response, and the high responders. Mice were about 14 months of age when we sacrificed them, and you can see that there is a reduction in A beta, significant reduction in A beta 40 and 42, only in the high responders. And there is insoluble A beta levels which reflects plaques, the A beta found in plaques. Basically, it's the uh, insoluble beta levels are below detection using this ELISA. So we were basically we were successful in uh, preventing a beta accumulation. And here is kind of dark, but you can uh, uh, basically just compare the high responders. This is just high magnification of different hypocampal uh, regions with all the control groups, and you can appreciate that basically there are no a beta deposits in these mice. When we look at the tau deposits. Again, we have untreated, adjuvant, low responders, high responders. You can see that the high responders don't have any somatolimpidic tau uh, deposits, despite the fact, again, that the steady state level of the tau transient remain unchanged. So basically here, uh, we use two different approaches, a genetic approach and, a, and a an immunological approach to show that if we can prevent a beta accumulation, we can prevent the uh, onset and progression of tau pathology despite the fact that the tau transient is still being expressed. So for us, this is strong evidence that hay beta is upstream of the tau pathology. Uh, so at this point, we are going to try to understand what's the molecular mechanism between these two proteins. And so there is evidence in the field that the hay beta accumulation might alter the, uh, the clearance pathway of the, of the neuron, in, and especially the ubiquitin proteasome system. In addition to that, other uh, set of data here from different groups show that this uh, chip function as an E3 ligase for tau. And especially uh, here, I want to point to this reference, show that deletion of this chip uh, basically leads to the accumulation of endogenous tau. So basically, this chip seems necessary for tau to ignore a normal turnout. So we wanted to determine if maybe A beta is altering chip function and the fourth tau cannot be uh, degraded and accumulates. So first we did some in vitro work. And so in here we have hex cells stably transferred with APP or wild type cells, and we measure, we measure chip levels. So in the chip levels are significantly lower in the cell lines stably transferred with APP. When we knock down APP levels using siRNA, again, chip levels were uh, back to uh, control. And uh, basically, when we use a gamma segregase inhibitor, here again, cell stably transfected with APP, the gamma segregase inhibitor will just block the production of A beta. The chip levels go back to the control. Actually, there's some kind of rebound, and we still don't understand why they go a little higher. Then we did some in vivo work. And in A, it's just a time course of chip levels comparing non transgenic and triple transgenic. And see how so, uh, basically for, with A, H, A beta builds up, we have a deficit in chip levels. And this deficit in chip levels is restored in the APP tau mice where they don't have A beta pathology and these other control mice. When we uh, inject the antibody directly into the brain, A beta antibody will rescue chip levels. And this is the uh, basically one year immunization experiments that I just show you, where the non transgenic uh, uh, are controlled, the adjuvant and the low responders have a significant impaired chip levels, whereas the high responders, the chip level go back. 
So based on this, we hypothesize that maybe a beta is blocking chip from, from uh, tagging tau, so tau cannot be uh, targeted to the proteasome, it therefore cannot be degraded. When we remove a beta using neurological genetic approaches, now chip levels will go back up and tau it gets degraded. So how do we go about and try to prove that? So what we did, we tried to increase chip levels using a, a lentivirus delivery system. So basically, we, in vivo, we inject a lentivirus, again, that into the brain, a lentivirus are expressing chip. When we uh, measure, um, basically, tau levels, you can see that in the area surrounding the injection site, basically, there is a decrease in tau levels. Whereas this is the same mouse, just area away from the injection site now, the uh, tau staining is the same between the two groups. When we do the same, the same results basically are, are currently in 18 months of age, it's just uh, this decrease in tau is less significant compared to younger mice. And this is just showing the quantification of same, same mice just away from the injection site. So here we were able to rescue tau pathology, even the presence of a beta bioexpressive chip. So to summarize this second and last part, we show that reducing a beta production delays the onset of progression of cognitive decline, and we show that preventing a beta accumulation using both an immunological and a genetic approach after the onset of progression of tau pathology, we show for the first time also that a beta reduces chip, and overexpression of chip reduces the a beta induced tau pathology. So now CHIP seems uh, to be a good therapeutic target, not only for a beta, but, but also for these uh, other disorders that are characterized by tower accumulation. Again, all this was done in Irvine, and now uh, how this is basically consistent with the handle cascade hypothesis that I was telling you in the beginning, which speculates the A beta accumulation is uh, the cause of all forms of Alzheimer's disease, sporadic or familiar Alzheimer's disease. And so we provide uh, a strong in vivo evidence that the beta is upstream of the tau pathology. And also we have some data that different forms of A-beta actually, that I didn't talk about today, different forms of A-beta can also induce the tau pathology. So I want to spend the last five minutes or less trying to tell you what we're planning to do here in San Antonio and hopefully find some collaborators. Mm -hmm. And so we have, um, we work mainly, mainly uh, three, three, we try to focus on three main areas. One is understanding the molecular mechanisms underlying early cognitive deficit in Alzheimer's disease. And so this uh, is um, arise from the fact that there are strong evidence in different transgenic animals from different, lab or, uh, different labs that the onset of cognitive decline in these mice precedes the, uh, any structural changes in the brain of these mice. So, for example, it's not just in our mice that plaques do not correlate with the cognitive decline. It's just, it's, it's basically in every transgenic animal uh, today. And so, basically, we hypothesize that uh, uh, basically the, uh, this, the onset of cognitive decline in these mice might be to, uh, due to soluble changes that occur in this brain. And so, we focus on the immediate early genes. So, we have some exciting preliminary data here to measure some of these immediate early genes. So, what we did. We, uh, it's known that Krebs activation is necessary for learning a memory. So what we did, we trained the mice, a group of mice, in the water maze for different for three or five days. And so if you can see in the non-transgenic, basically there is an increase in Krebs activation as the, the mice, the more learn, the, as they learn, three days, if you convert three days non-transgenic to five days, there's an increase in Krebs in, in Kreb activation. Again, nothing new there. However, in the triple transgenic mice, there is some activation in CREM. However, as detected by this phosphocreme antibody, however, it stays constant. It is not, it is, they lack this, age, this uh, learning dependent increase in CREM activation. We also look at AKT or phospho AKT, for, uh, uh, which, ref which reflects some activity of uh, these uh, kinases, which is upstream of CREM. And again, we find similar results. So from this, we uh, basically have a couple of aims, and we are now designing a lentivirus or express trying to increase CREB activation in, uh, uh, in vivo. So the hypothesis the A beta is somehow directly or indirectly altering CREB activation, and so mice cannot learn. 
to, to try to uh, test this hypothesis, we will uh, try to bypass this A beta block on CREP by directly increasing CREP activation. We will do this by using a lentiviral uh, approach. We also are looking at other uh, immediate early genes, and we're using both candidate and unbiased approach to find if other pathways, other uh, molecular pathways, are altered as a consequence of A beta accumulation. Again, these are four months old mice. The only uh, changes they have is an increase in A beta levels. There are no plaques, no tau stage. The other um, part of my problem is that we're trying to understand the molecular pathways underlying frontotemporal lower degeneration. And so the last uh, two years, this is the second most common form of dementia in people younger than 65. In the last two years, there's been a, there's been a, a great improvement in the knowledge of this disorder. And basically, there are two forms of this, two forms of this frontotemporal lobar degeneration. One is characterized by tau accumulation, and one is characterized by tau negative ubiquity positive inclusions. And so only about two years ago, it has been shown that mutation in a, in a, progranulin, in a gene called progranulin, loss of function mutation in this gene, leads to uh, frontotemporal dementia. And a few months after that, people have found the, uh, the, the um, main protein that accumulates in this inclusion, it's, called, it's a DNA binding protein called GDP. So we try to make an animal model from the temporal double degeneration using two different approaches. We try to make two different animal models using two different approaches. Here we use the tetrocyclically tet inducible model where we basically, we are um, overexpressing uh, some SHRNA against the progranulin gene. Again, these are, uh, these are loss of function mutation, and under the control of the uh, TRE promoter. The TRE promoter to, to work, it needs to bind to a trans activator. So what we, do, what we do, we put the trans activator under the control of neuronal specific promoter. So the trans activator is just expressing the neurons, and when the trans activator binds to the TRE promoter, the TRE promoter is active, and we have expression of the SHRNA and the four programming knockdown. We can, so we have a regional specificity by putting the trans under the control of a neuronal specific promoter. We also have a temporal specificity because we can add to the drinking water, to the food, the doxycycline, which will bind in red here, which will bind to the trans activator, precluding the, trans, the, the activation of the TRE promoter. So in, in the presence of doxycycline, we have no SHRNA expression, normal levels of programming. And so we now have screened a few uh, different SHRNA in vitro, and we selected one, and we are uh, working on the cloning to, to make this animal. We're also doing, um, so this is basically from the basic, uh, this is arise from the mutation science in this programming gene. However, the protein that accumulates the brain of these people is called TDP43. The relation between these two, pro these two proteins are known. So we're trying to attack the problem from two, two, two different angles, and we, made, uh, we are making an animal model straight over expressing this t human TDP into, uh, the, into the brain using a neuronal specific promoters. And these mice are, this construct is going to be injected in, about, in less than two weeks. To, to, so by the end of October, we should have a uh, first families for this animal. The third part of the, the uh, program is use genetic approaches to probe neuronal function. Here, what we will do is we will use a, uh, we plan to use a, a lesion model uh, using, using transgenic techniques. And so what we do, we have uh, this constant where the TTA, which is toxin, is under the TRE promoter. So these toxins are lethal for neurons, and so expression of this toxin will kill only the neurons that express the toxin. So nothing is the, the, uh, will affect the surrounding neurons. So what we do, we are putting, again, the theory promoter is only expressed in the presence of the TTA. So what we do, or the trans activator, is what we do, we put, we put the trans activator under the control of the, the, of the dopaminergic transporter promoter. So only dopaminergic neurons will express the, the trans activator, and so only dopaminergic neurons will be killed. And again, this is without any lesion of surrounding areas, without any intrusion to the brain or anything like that. Again, we can decide to turn on and off the expression of the trans activator by adding and removing doxycycline from, uh, from our uh, 
from the food or from the water. And again, this way we have a genetic approach where we can selectively treat the combinatorial chicken <laughs> and and uh, basically we can study uh, the how these mice what's the role of the dopamination neurons, for example, during aging, and we can study recovery mechanisms because we can, after killing uh, a certain percentage of mice, of neurons, basically we can put doxycycline back on, we can turn off expression of the transgene, and thus we can study how the, how the dopaminergic system will recover, we can study the plasticity of the dopaminergic system, both during, for example, uh, early, uh, during as a function of age, during aging. Again, we have already used, in uh, my older lab, we, are used a, we already used a similar <coughs> approach where the transactivator was under the control of the, a, uh, a general uh, neuronal specific promoter chem kinase, and we were able by titrating the amount of doxycycline at the time of doxycycline of the induction, we were able to selectively kill uh, hippocampal neurons. And so these, these data are published, and so the system works. And so we try to use it uh, to probe uh, dopamine uh, to test the, the plasticity of the dopamine system. And I want to conclude stressing out that this, the, it's, this is a very flexible system. Basically, by changing the promoter, if you have a, a neuronal specific promoter or a, any, you can target the expression of the transactivator in a specific subpopulation of neurons, and you can kill selectively those neurons. In a, and you can decide when to kill it for how long to keep the TA expression, and you can turn it on, back on and off. Finally, I want to thank my uh, former advisor, Frank Laferla, and uh, everybody in this lab, our collaborator in Irvine, in, in Irvine and, uh, and basically uh, Dylan, they helped with antibody injection, and Bill Klein, they gave, he gave us some antibody, and the NIH and NIA for funding some of these studies. Thanks. Yes. How do how do you know once the 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 tau protein is a uh, is a uh, addressed by the antibody? How do you know that it becomes toxic? The 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 remaining of the protein, or is a, a inflammatory response to to the antibody uh, binding this protein. So we didn't use any approach against the tau is decreased because there is no AB. So the antibody is both during the active and passive immunization. For the active immunization, we use an AB <coughs> an beta peptide. So the antibody is uh, is against the A beta protein. For the passive immunization, we directly inject an A beta antibody. And so there are uh, several groups throughout the, country, throughout the world basically trying to address the mechanism underlying this antibody mediated clearance of A-beta. And there are different hypotheses. However, for our study, we were, our goal was to determine the effect on tau, was not to determine the effect on A-beta, how the antibody clears A-beta. But I can tell you there are um, uh, two or three point of views, not from our studies, again, we didn't do anything. And so one involves a microglia activation, like you were mentioning, and there are, there are evidence that uh, basically the antibody will activate microglia response, the microglia will clear this a beta plus, mm -hmm. this a beta deposit from the brain. Other people have shown and have proposed what's called a sync hypothesis. So they have injected an antibody, in, uh, directly the antibody into the, uh, into the periphery, and based on their data, the antibody does not cross the blood brain barrier, and yet they have clearance of A beta deposit from the brain. So they, what they proposed is that the A beta will bind, it will suppress A, uh, A beta from the periphery, and so altering an equilibrium at the blood brain barrier between A, A, between A beta into the brain, A beta uh, outside the brain. So altering this equilibrium, more A beta will be secreted from the brain to the periphery, more A beta will be removed from the periphery and the fall from the brain. And so people know there are two current points of view, people are trying to argue, and it seems, you know, it's, one does not exclude the other. Nevertheless, you know, even these, um, now there are clinical trials in people even with passive immunization, injecting the periphery directly to the antibody. The results don't, you know, if you look at the stock of the, of the company, the results don't seem to, to promising, but this, the clinical trial is still. 
Does it matter when you inject? Does it matter uh, if you inject early on during the lifespan or after the disease process? Yes. Time? Yes. Um, uh, it does. Because if we inject early on in two months of age, we can prevent, there is no a bed, at least in the mice, right? In this experimental condition, there is no a bed accumulation, there is no tau accumulation. If we inject late in the disease progress, we can remove soluble beta, we can remove soluble tau, but plaques and tangles are still there. So even though our data support the idea that soluble forms of a beta tau are more toxic, it does not exclude that these plaques and tangles might still be detrimental for the brain. And so, for example, they may still damage the brain in other ways that our behavioral tests cannot detect in the mice. And so, again, if you want to, by doing the ABED intervention early on, at least based on the, uh, on the uh, animal studies, it seems that we can prevent both ABED accumulation and tau accumulation. That's, so that would be probably a better way. Would your experiment suggest that it should be a childhood immunization program <laughs> <laughs> rather than well, elderly? Uh, well, yeah, maybe. Maybe if you see, you know, by mid-century, uh, more than 10 million people will, will suffer this disorder. But the clinical trial is from mid to severe, I think, uh, uh, patients. So it's not preventing; it's just therapy. And the therapeutic trials with the immunotherapy in humans has not been yeah, particularly not successful. Yeah. So, and it's, since you can't really make the diagnosis early, it's done relatively late. So the approach of the immunotherapy after it's already started seems to be too late. Your right. That's too why we did some late. of these experiments. Yeah. We started doing experiments in mice with plaques and tangles to see what would then happen. And so the, 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 the clinical trial is, depends from which point of view you see it. If you see it from an MD point of view, they're not working. Right. And because you, know, you have side effect and people get brain inflammation or, uh, or they have to, in the, second in the second trial, they have to exclude some, immune, some people based on their uh, APOE genotype. But from a scientific point of view, the few cases that have been to autopsy since there is a clearance of A beta following that. So from a scientific point of view, you know, this approach warrants more further you know, evaluation and, and things like that. From a, name, from a clinical point of view, yeah, it's, it, I don't know if we failed because, you know, if during the first clinical trial, about 6% of people got uh, in brain encephalitis, which is not too many considering. So I don't know if I would uh, be against me getting vaccinated if I knew that I had the disease. Not today, but if I knew that I had the disease, maybe I would take the chance of getting brain encephalitis. Which in most of the cases, people, in most of the cases people recovered after they stopped the, the vaccine, if I remember correctly. Now there was a follow-up that came out this summer, I think, in Lancet, so it showed the pathology where they had cleared the A beta, but yet the progression of the disease wasn't halted. That was taken pretty right. But they stopped the vaccine, so the most people received two or three injections. So you know, I couldn't expect a big clinical results in people with after two injections or three, the most. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's a failure. You know, right? you know, they they changed their experimental paradigm. They're doing active and passive now, but it still warrants probably more and more. Scientific evidence, or maybe pre clinical trial. The presence of CHIP um, is interesting to me because it, it makes me wonder, kind of looking at it on a devil's advocate, Moko, does, does this still implicate that A beta is upstream, or is it maybe just kind of um, maybe something that's maybe CHIP is upstream and, and A beta is just affecting CHIP, per se? Right, so if A beta is affecting CHIP, a beta is absolute. So without a beta accumulation, you get no chip deficit before no time. So the way we see this is that our hypothesis is that a beta again is via mechanism we don't know is altering chip levels. So chip cannot tie tau to the proteasome. If a beta is not there, now chip function is normally and therefore tau is the beta. 
yeah, this is uh, just one study we've done. The study is going under review, and after probably my old PI will try to follow up and try to understand how I made actually does after chip. I've been missing your first slide shows there is a chemical cascade. Right. To show the secretase uh, mm -hmm. alpha, beta, gamma there. What triggered this uh, cascade stop? That, that's when I didn't get it. So the, in 5% of the cases. I know you go to uh, secretase beta. Right. It's uh, No, in 5% of the cases, uh, sorry, in 5% of the people with Alzheimer's disease, so 5% of the people have a mutation in one of the genes involved in this cascade. And so all the mutations up to today lead to an increase in a beta production. However, in 95% of the cases, it's a, a sporadic Alzheimer's disease and the causes are not known. There is a uh, risk. They have an The data is not strong. They have a beta, more a beta in the brain. They have a beta deposits. There is no strong evidence supporting this more beta secretase activity. The the only, so the risk factor is known, it's the presence of this E4 allele of the APOE gene, which is also involved in a beta metabolism. So every, all the genetic, all the human genetic data point to A beta as the um, central in the disease process. But you know, for the 95% of the cases, the, the, the trigger is not known. What causes A beta from accumulating on this metabolism? Only with the 5%.